Welcome to Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. We're so glad to have you here with us tonight. Forgive me if I'm a little out of breath and looking down at a few things. This is completely different for us. Once we adjust just a few things. It's a completely different setup than we normally have, but I do invite you to be part of what we are doing here tonight and the fact that we are going to be live having our prayer service here tonight. And I just want to see that this actually is going to show up. And it is. So good. I'm glad that we're here together. I can see that now. And I'm going to back out of that. But I do welcome you to Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, our live stream of our prayer time and Bible study tonight. We do this each week, Wednesday night, at least we were, up until all that is taking place. And we certainly want to continue and have church and a gathering together of believers as much as possible, even if it is on the Internet. And so that's what we're doing tonight, and we're going to continue to have Facebook Live events uh, again this Sunday, uh, 945 and 1045. We will have services uh, streaming, and then we will play it by ear as far as what is in the going on in the news, what is being advised at that time. We don't do it live only right now out of fear. We've talked a lot about that but out of respect and recognition of what is going on in our world. And we certainly invite you to prayerfully seek the Lord in these things and look to Him. And as I preached a few weeks ago, we are not to be paralyzed by fear. Over and over again in the Bible it says, don't be afraid. God is in control. We can know that. In an uncertain time, we can be certain of that. And so I invite you to do just that. Do want to share a few things with you tonight as we get started. Again, I don't want to keep you long. Uh, it's going to be a little different than what we normally do here on Wednesday night because normally we gather together. We also have classes for students upstairs and downstairs here in this little country church. But we're going to do things a little differently. Um, our prayer requests tonight uh, will be our prayer requests tonight will be a little bit less specific. Normally, when we're together as a church, we share things amongst ourselves, uh, and I know what everybody wants shared, and if something doesn't need to be shared, I don't share it. But with other people, other than just our church family watching, perhaps, we want to be a little bit more general and pray a little differently. But nonetheless, we want to pray. If ever there was a time for us to pray, it is now. It's always time to pray. God has always called on us to pray, wanted us to pray. It's our way of talking to him. But certainly we look in Second Chronicles and we see that if my people will pray, humble themselves and pray, and he will he hear our prayers. And if we turn from our wicked ways, he will hear our prayers and he will heal our land. And we certainly want to do that tonight. I do want to point out a few things as well, some very exciting things very quickly as a way of a commercial, if you will. But as I've been posting on Facebook, if you've seen this already, this will be redundant, but I'm going to share it anyway. Necessity has been said to be the mother of invention. I also say it's the mother of motivation. There's some things that I've been wanting to do here at Pleasant Hill uh, to incorporate or to evolve in, if you will, uh, and put in place that have been procrastinated about or just didn't seem like it was the right time. And now, certainly, we've been motivated to do some of these things, live streaming, uh, YouTube videos, making some other videos that we can put on, devotional blogs, devotional thoughts, all these kind of things. And so now we're live streaming. We also, in case someone wants to go back and watch or hear or they can't watch all the live stream, you can go and in a few hours or an hour or so, you can go onto YouTube uh, and you can go on to uh, search for Pleasant Hill SBC, and you can watch it there. You also can go to PleasantHillSBC.com, and you can see devotional thoughts. You can see devotional uh, sermons. You can see. You can click on YouTube and go there as well, and see those sermons. And so we invite you to take part in all of that. And we're doing those things now. Uh, also, we are going to be in our 
uh, available now on certain podcasts that you can listen. If you don't have time to watch, you can certainly even listen just to the audio. We're working on that as well on Apple uh, Podcasts. will soon be will soon be available also on Pandora, on Spotify, uh, others that you can go. And again, you can go to Pleasant Hill SBC in one central area, and you can find those. But I invite you to check that out. And if you use Spotify or Pandora or uh, Apple Podcasts, you can listen there. And so I do welcome you again. I do want to jump right in with some prayer requests. Normally we go through all of our prayer requests together. Um, I had a few that were sent to me in private that were asked not to mention. Uh, I'm going to pull up the Facebook live stream and see if I do see any uh, prayer requests at, uh, being posted. And I have not yet, so therefore, uh, I will. if I see those, I will do that. Even though I said to have them in by a certain time, I do want to try to accommodate those if I can. But I just may not be able to do that. Um, I do want uh, to turn to God in prayer. Certainly want to look to Him. He's the one that can hear. He's the one that can answer. He's the one that can act. He's the one that's trustworthy in all of this, and we can look to him. And I know people say, why do things like this happen? The reason things like this happen is because we live in a sin-cursed world, and sin has consequences. Not necessarily your my sin causing this disease. That's not what I'm saying. Sin in general, a sin-cursed world. God cursed the world so that we would know that there is sin, that there is a need of a Redeemer, a Savior, Jesus Christ. And ever since Genesis 3.15, he's been promised to come, and we can, they look to him coming. He now has come and died on the cross for us, and we can look back. We can put our trust in him. But it's to get our attention, to draw us close to him, so that we will see that we need a Savior. And one day, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, when he comes and takes us out of this world, makes this world new, he will put an end to all these things, the suffering, the pain, the tears, uh, the hurting, the sin, the wickedness, the evil, the violence. It will all come to an end and be made new and perfect. And so I just want to encourage you with that today. I do want to uh, share some prayer requests with you, uh, just a few that I'm going to mention, um, and then you can pray with me. We're going to pray. I'll just go ahead and give you some topics. We're going to start out with praise. Uh, and you can pray along with me. Uh, you also, as we, as we praise God for many, many things, we do want to praise for this nation, our world that we live in, not just with the coronavirus, but certainly that will be part. Uh, we also do want to pray, of course, this is a prayer group meeting from Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. We're going to pray for our church as well for other churches. Uh, we do want to pray for our shut-ins of our church. I'm not going to call them by name tonight, but... If you go to Pleasant Hill, you know who they are, and as part of those shut-ins, maybe you have shut-ins uh, from your church or uh, uh, elderly that are in nursing homes or in the hospital or homebound, and we want to pray for them as well. We want to pray for schools. Uh, I know schools are out right now, but for teachers and for the students and for learning, as many of them are doing uh, home-based learning or long-distance learning, and, uh, of course, we're going to pray for personal and physical needs, just not be real specific. And uh, we certainly want to end as well in praise. I do want to give one update, uh, one specific prayer request I think would be okay for me to share. Uh, and that is just this. Many of you have seen on Facebook where my grandmother, I call her mother, uh, my older brother, uh, could not say granny mother when he was a little child. And so it came out just plain mother. And if they ever wondered why we call her mother, that is why. Uh, and she is 94 years old. She has recently come to live with my parents after living with my Uncle Terry and Aunt Janice in California for many, many years. And now she is living with my parents in Greenville uh, and with my brother and sister-in-law, helping them as well. And she recently had stroke or stroke symptoms. They say it was not a stroke that she had at the time that they took her to the hospital, but in the past... And very briefly, or as briefly as I can, uh, she's been in the hospital for the past few days having stroke-like symptoms, and even going into a catatonic state, 
They're a little uh, confused and frustrated as far as why these things are happening. Uh, but do keep her in your prayer. She is able to communicate. She is able to eat. She does battle uh, with some other physical things that any 94-year-old woman, I'm guessing, does. Uh, but uh, just keep her in your prayers. For those of you that know her, she is beloved by many. If you do not know her and ever met her, you would instantly fall in love with her. Uh, she does not look like she's 94. You would never have guessed it, even though we've watched her age dramatically in the last few years. She still uh, does not look that way. And she has a heart for people. A former pastor's wife, uh, many, many years of ministry, and loves the Lord, knows the Lord, and longs to be with the Lord. And uh, we know that in this life, as well as when her time does come, that he is in her hands, and we are comforted by that. But I do want to mention Emma Leach. That's my grandmother, my mother's mother. Keep my mother, Charlotte McGarry, and uh, my uncle, Terry Leach, in particular. That's her children in your prayers. Uh, but she is doing fair, just in the hospital, and certainly some uncertainty. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to peek a little bit at my sheet every now and then. You may see me do that but I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. I invite you to do that as well and pray along with me, if you would, uh, as we pray together for the next several minutes. And then I'm going to share a Bible study, and I'm going to share a message. Lord, what would you have me to do out of Acts chapter 9? And so let's pray, and I invite my church family and anybody else that's watching uh, to pray with me. Dear Father, we do come to you tonight. Father, we do. Father, first of all, we just want to praise you. We want to praise you for who you are. Father, you are God and we are not. Father, you are mighty and we are weak. God, you are wise and all-knowing and you have seen all of these things that have been taking place in this world long before now. From the beginning of time, you know each of us. Father, you know our needs, you know our hurts, you know our pains, and we thank you that you are God and that you know those things and that you feel our pain. Oh, God, we thank you for that. And, God, we also thank you that we don't have to try to be God. We don't have to try to be in control. We don't have to try to worry about things that are outside of our control, but we can trust you, and we thank you for the faith that you give us. We thank you for the way you allow us to trust you. Help us to keep our eyes on you and to look to you and to trust you. Thank you for all that you are doing and have done and will do for us. Father, most of all, for salvation. God, if there's anybody here tonight under the sound of my voice that's watching or hears my voice that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that, that today, the day they hear my voice, that they would call on you, that they would experience your love and your forgiveness, and, oh God, that you would wash away their sins and that you would come into their heart and that you would have a relationship with them and give them peace and comfort. But, oh God, thank you for salvation, for love, for comfort that you can provide, a, a peace that passes all understanding. Father, we thank you and we praise you for who you are. Oh God, thank you for the weather you've given us. Thank you for this sunshine to shine on us. Father, thank you for the rains that we've had in recent days as well. Oh God, thank you for hearing our prayers tonight. Thank you that we can enter boldly into the throne room of grace and we can pray. And we can call on you, Father, we don't do it arrogantly. Father, we don't do this for show. Father, we don't do this for anything other than desperation and a need of you. And we thank you that you can show us that and, and draw us close to you. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers and the fact that you can act upon our prayers. Go, oh God, your will be done. But God, turn our hearts to be like that of your heart. Oh God, I pray that you would... Be glorified for the way you bless us. Oh, God, for the opportunities that we have now in these days, these dark days. But, oh, God, that we see the silver lining, that we see how you're using these days to draw us to you. God, that you use these things to draw our attention and our prayers and our hearts closer to you. God, that when we have questions, we would ask. When we have concerns, we would express them. You already know our heart, and, God, that you would do just that and, and help us, Father, that, that, in, in the ways that we need. We thank you that you are. Thank you for giving us opportunities like this. Many ways, Father, that in days like this that people are looking for answers. And God, if we know you, we have the answer. You are the answer. And thank you for the opportunity that you give us to be able to share the good news with somebody else in times 
like this. Thank you for giving us more time with our families. Oh God, there's so many that kids are home from school and from college and, and from work. And Father, we often look at that and say, oh, what are we going to do? But oh God, thank you for the time to spend with family. To, to spend time and to, about things that really matter. And that is you and that is what you've given us, Father, our families, our loved ones. Father, help us, I pray, to see and to praise your name. Thank you for opening our eyes to what really matters. We get so caught up in the busyness of life. And, oh, Father, now there's so many people that have time. Have time, and thank you for that gift. God, I thank you that you're in control, that we don't have to fear. Father, I thank you that we, that, that, that we don't have to worry again about being in control. Uh, Father, I thank you also that we're not alone. Father, so many times we feel alone. But, Father, help us to know that we're not alone. If we know you, you are with us in our hearts, but also your presence. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. And we praise you. We worship you. We glorify you for that fact. Father, thank you for being the help that we so desperately need. Father, I pray that you would meet our every need. And, Father, we come to you as some of those needs tonight. Father, we do pray for this world that we live in, this nation that we love. Father, if we're here in the sound of my voice in America, we love America. But, Father, those that maybe hear my voice and they're not in this nation, Father, I pray that you give them a love for their nation. And, and, Father, I pray that you would be with their nation, be with those peoples, Father, all kinds of peoples across this globe. Father, I think of China and Italy and Spain and Iraq and, and, and South Korea in particular, Iran and South Korea in particular. But, Father, so many other nations other than our own that are suffering greatly. And, Father, I pray that you would uh, do a work and a wonder in their nation as well. But, God, this world that we live in, Father, I pray that you would help us, Father, to look to you. Be with our president, with our elected officials. Father, I pray that you'd be with our president. And, Father, that you would guard and guide his lips, his mind, his heart, his soul. Father, I pray that he would look to you. Father, uh, Father he needs to look to you. Father, give him the wisdom that he needs. Father, it is in your word that you say you lift up kings, and that means presidents as well. And, Father, you have him as president for a reason, and I thank you for that. God, I pray that you would guide his steps, that you would give him the strength he needs. Father, that you give him the wisdom that he needs, that he would turn to you in prayer as he's told us to turn to you. Father, that, that he would turn to you. Father, I pray for our other elected officials in Congress and our uh, in Congress, in, 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 the, in the House, and in the Senate. Father, I pray that you would be with Nancy Pelosi. I pray that you would be with uh, uh, the other leaders that are there. Father, even the ones that we agree with, the ones that we don't agree with, that you would turn their hearts to you, that you would lead them to lead our country back to you, that you would lead them the way we ought to go, that you would lead them to work together in the steps that are needed, Father. Father, we don't look to the government. We look to you. But, Father, you sometimes use governments. And, Father, I pray that you'd help them to work together, to come up with solutions and, and steps in these days and the days ahead. Father, I pray that you'd put aside, help them put aside differences and come together for the best interest of Americans as a whole. And, Father, to do your will. And, Father, to look to you. Change hearts. Guide hearts. Save lives, I pray, in our elected officials. Father, also our local officials. Father, our local elected officials, whether it be state or whether it be our, our cities and our counties, Father, I pray that you'd be with them as well. Turn their hearts, strengthen them, give them the courage to do what is right. Give them clarity of thought. Oh, God, I pray. Father, I pray for the elections that are coming up, that people would make decisions based on your word. Father, that people would make decisions on what's best for America, and that's to follow you. And, God, that you would raise up men and women, Father, to be the leaders that they ought to be, to be the elected officials they ought to be. Oh, God, I thank you. Father, I pray that you'd be with our military. Watch over our National Guard and our armed forces, Father, in these days, whether they be home or abroad. Father, there's so much talk of them being needed in various places. God, Father, guide and guard and protect them. Thank you for their selfless service to this nation. Father, I pray that you, we would be thankful and prayerful for them. Thank you for families that have sacrificed their young men and young women, Father, to go and to fight for us and to defend freedom and fight for our rights. And, Father, I pray that you guard and guide and protect them. Give them uh, uh, peace as well as they do their jobs. Father, I pray that you also would be with the first responders here, whether it be EMS workers or firefighters or police officers. Father, I pray that you'd be with them and 
Some of them are on the front lines of this battle. And, Father, I pray that you'd watch over them as well. Father, I pray that you'd be with uh, our community as a whole. Father, I pray that you'd help them to see you in this. Father, they'd be drawn to you in this. And, Father, I pray that they, that they would see the love and the hope that you can offer to them. Father, the salvation that you can offer to them. And that they would look to you. And that they would see other believers looking. And it would draw their attention and give opportunity, Father, for us. Oh, God, I pray. God, I pray that you would be this coronavirus. Specifically, I'm asking now, Father, be your will to bring an end to this plague, this disease, this sickness. Father, I pray that you do it quickly. Father, you're in control. And, Father, that doesn't mean that you sent it, but you certainly allowed it. And it's for a reason. And, God, that doesn't make you cruel or mean or hateful, but, Father, you're doing it to draw our attention. But, God, that also means just like the seas, you can calm them, you can stop them, you can say, peace, be still, and it can come to an end. But, Father, you can also heal lives and touch families and give comfort. And, Father, I pray that you'd be with those that are in need today. Father, for those in the front lines, medical officials, doctors, and nurses, and those that are working in nursing homes, and, and Father, uh, practicing medicine, trying to help others, trying to diagnose, trying to test, trying to treat God, that you not only would give them wisdom and, and our scientists' wisdom in coming up with medicines and cures, whether here or abroad, but also with those that are firsthand dealing. Father, protect them that are dealing firsthand with people that may have this illness. Father, I pray that you just guard and, and protect the doctors and the nurses and the EMS workers. Father, not just in this disease, but in so many other areas. Father, help us to be thankful for them. For retail and grocery, Father, we take these things for granted. But, Father, so many of them are still out at work, and that's a blessing because they're getting paid. But, Father, they're out there when the rest of us are told to be staying at home and trying not to spread this. And they're out there in the front lines, bank tellers and gas station clerks. And, Father, watch over them. Strengthen them. Give them peace. Help them to look to you. Oh, God, I pray that for those that are suffering, that have lost loved ones, so many now that have died from this disease. And, God, I pray that you'd be with those that are sick and struggling. Father, that you bring health and remedy. Father, that you prevent others from being sick and to be pleasing to you. And but Father, that you would touch those that are sick, touch those families that have lost someone. Give them a comfort. Give them a peace. Oh, God, I pray that you'd be exactly what only you can be to so many people today. God, for those that are afraid, there are people that are scared, whether it be from sickness or whether it be from finances or, Father, for their own families, their own parents, their own grandparents. Father, I pray that you would just touch and give a peace and a calm and father calm the fears help us not to be petrified but to be motivated father to to look to you and to turn to you father you are a hope and you're a remedy and you can offer healing and father a flattening of this curve as they talked about you can do that oh god father i pray that people would see you in this and see your work and say it was only god that did this and father you give the wisdom to tell us to do certain things and common sense but it's still you and, God, I pray that you'd also help us see all that you have done and all that you are doing. That's not worse than it, than it is and that it could be. God, I pray that you just help us to look to you and see you throughout this. Father, it be your will to bring us back to a sense of normalcy, to restore things back. Father, in some ways we don't need them back to, to the old normal. But, Father, for the new normal, that we'd be able to get back to work and be able to get back to life. But, Father, that you'd have drawn us to you. God, I pray that you would be of this church. Father, help us to be a lighthouse and help us to be a, 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 a lighthouse of hope and love and truth. Father, you be a, help us to be a hospital to the sick and the weary and the needy. Help us to always be pointing people to you. Help us to be salt and light. Help us to stand in the truth. Help us to be courageous in the truth. Help us to share the truth. Oh, God, help believers everywhere, churches everywhere, not to give up, but to turn people to you and to turn to you themselves. And to set an example, oh God, I pray. Father, be with me as a leader. Give me direction. Give me urgency and passion, Father, to help whoever I can. And a love for people. Father, help me. Give me the strength that I need. Father, there's times that I'm uncertain. And I don't know. I admit it. Oh God, help me, I pray. God, I pray that you'd be with our financial and our, our various needs here at this church and in other churches. Father, the spiritual needs that we have. Father, I pray that you'd meet those in this church. Father, for our various ministries. Father, I can't name them all, but I do want to thank especially of Rock Bailey and our release time program at R.C. Edwards. Father, those kids that I just found out are now able to do long distance learning for the release time. 
public school students being taught the Bible. Now we've been doing this for six semesters, and God, I just thank you for that and for lives that have been changed and students who normally wouldn't be able to be taught Bible in public school. But Father, we're able to bring them here to the church, and we thank you that you've allowed this, and the government has allowed this, and we thank you that it's able to take place. Be with Brock and his family. Help him. The other teachers of the release time programs, not just here in, in, in South Carolina, the upstate, and in Pickens County, but Father, in the other counties and across this country. Oh God, I pray that you'd be with those needs. Give them strength. Give them learning, Father. Give, draw them close to you, those young hearts to you. Father, I pray that others would partner with us, that churches would not fight amongst themselves, but that we'd partner together. And God, I pray that you would help us to pray for each other. Father, I pray for the other churches in the area. Father, I pray specifically just thinking of my brother Rex Simmons as he's uh, starting a new church, Father, in Piedmont. Father, I pray that you'd be with him. And Father, I pray that you'd touch that ministry. Father, others in this six-mile central community, Father, I thank God that you'd just pray that you'd be with them. As well, Father, so many that want to take a stand and want to lead and love. Father, I pray that you'd help them as they communicate in these times of, of uncertainty. And, and how to do that? We didn't go to seminary and learn how to deal with a pandemic. But God, help us, I pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us again to be a lighthouse and a hospital to the, to the sin sick. Father, to, to those that are hurting. Father, I pray that we would just be a, a station of hope and faith to point people to you. But I pray for the elderly, our shut-ins in our church and across this nation, people that are more at risk for this coronavirus, and by the people that are home by themselves in nursing homes and secluded, Father, draw close to them. Help us reach out to them as well. Help them to know your presence and your love today. Father, I pray that you'd help uh, the, the others that are infirmed and, Father, that are more at risk because of this coronavirus. Touch them, I pray, as well. Again, be their schools. Be with those that... Uh, uh, that you help them learn and be the teachers that they try to communicate during these unusual techniques and times. Father, I pray that you'd also be the administration and with the students, give them learning and safety. Give them understanding of what's taking place and, and, and help them to remain focused. God, I pray that you'd also be, as we wrap up this prayer here shortly, with our personal needs, with our personal spiritual needs, help us to look to you. Help us to call on you. Help us to pray. Help us to repent of our failures and shortcomings and sin. Father, we are, if we know you, Father, we're forgiven, but at the same time, we still fall and fail. We're not perfect people. Oh, God, we're just forgiven. And, Father, help others to see that and, and to want that and to turn to you for the salvation that you can provide. That's the most important thing we can even ask for. God, I pray that you'd help us to claim your promises, to remember your promises. Father, help us to continue to grow and to worship in these difficult times when we can't gather together. And, Father, it's difficult sometimes, and we feel isolated to help us to know that we're two or three. And, Father, if, if you and I are in this room, we are. That's two. And, Father, we're two or three are gathered in your name. You're there in our midst. And, Father, I pray that you'd be with us as we've gathered here together online. God, I pray that you'd be with different uh not just the spiritual needs and, and that our faith would be increased and, and that those that don't believe would have their eyes opened and turned to you for salvation, but God also for physical needs, for health struggles. Father, there's so many health struggles that have been going on, not just in this church, but across this world, and not just now, but many times. Sometimes things are not said, things aren't known, but God, you know. And God, I pray that you'd also be with all those that are having surgical and procedural postponements because of what's taking place. Father, I pray that you the financial needs and the crisis that's going on even now because of the coronavirus. Those that have lost jobs and the people that are out of work. And Father, I pray that you'd help Congress again to work together. Father, again, not that we look to them, but Father, I pray that, that, that they'd be able to help the people. Father, I pray that you'd also be with our families, marriages, our children. Father, unspoken needs. Father, oh God, we have needs. Help us to turn to you. Father, I thank you for meeting the needs and pray that we'll trust you to meet those needs. God, most of all, turn our hearts to be that in tune with yours. Father, I pray that you, your will would be done. We desire your will be done through us, in us, just as it is in heaven. We praise you that it is. We praise you that it will be. We thank you that we can, pray, we can claim the promise that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to your purposes. Thank you, God, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you for praying with me. I hope that you have done that. Again, I hope you're still with me. Um, I'm going to very quickly now, in the time that we have left, very quickly, just in the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to share a little Bible study with you. Lord, what would you have me to do? And I want you to turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, in your copy of God's Word. And in Acts chapter 9, this is in the early church history. And to give you a little context now, the church of Jerusalem was the early church. Christ has died. He's risen again. He's ascended into heaven. Uh, the church has been gathering, and they're scared. And they're scared because there's a man named Saul, who later becomes Paul. But this time he's Saul, and he's th making threats, and he's imprisoning, and he's persecuting the church, or he's leading that charge in many ways. And in the previous chapters, we saw where a man named Stephen was stoned to death because of his belief in Christ, and Paul was consenting to that, and he held the coats, and he was part of that execution, that public execution there some 2,000 years ago. And we pick up now in chapter 9, in verse 1, and it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that was the churches of the day, and if, and if he found any of this way, that's what they called believers in Christ. They weren't yet called Christians, but those that were of the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And that's where I get that phrase from. Lord, what would you have me to do? What wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And I'm going to stop there. The rest of the story is, is that they lead him into the city. He meets a man named Simon who God had got, sent a message to him and spoken to him and said, Hey, Saul is coming. The man was scared. He said, Hey, I'm sending him to you. He is mine now. He's saved. And I want you to help him. And I want you to see, though, this thought, this thought, Lord, what would you have me to do? You see, I think that God, although... I think that God has got our attention or is trying to get our attention. It may be things in your personal life. It may be personal crisis you're going through. It may be troubles or struggles. It may be a death in your family. It may be a sickness. It may be whatever that storm is. Specifically, we could talk about the coronavirus, and that's what brought me to this thought. But God is trying to get our attention. And I heard a preacher once say, and I shared this last week as, or last Sunday as well, that God sometimes throws a pebble and then a stone and then a brick and then a boulder, and he's trying to get your attention. And this coronavirus has certainly been a pretty big splash to get our attention. And I think that's what he is doing. And the light shining on, on Saul was getting his attention. It knocked him to the ground. He was blinded. That got his attention. And this coronavirus, or whatever it is in your life, whether you think it's a big deal or not a big deal, it's got the attention of many, and maybe it's something else in your life. But God is trying to get your attention, and our response ought to be, God, what, what do you want? What do you want me to do? Oh, God, tell me. And so I want you to see tonight that God is trying to get your attention, and he wants your attention. He'll do things to get your attention, but you've got to choose to give him your attention. Someone can throw rocks at you all day long, but you never look to see who's throwing rocks. People can knock you down, but you never look to see who's knocking you down. There are some people that are so caught up in what they're doing in their own way, in their own things, that the world explodes around them, and it doesn't get their attention. Or they choose to ignore the chaos. But God is trying to get your attention, and you have a free will, a free choice. Are you going to... Pay attention and say, hey, where's that coming from? Why is this going on? What is, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is it you're trying to do? Or are you going to ignore him? You have a free choice. But I'm praying that you would give God your attention. Saul 
gave God his attention. Now, at first, he didn't know who it was. He said, who are you, Lord? But he turned his attention to the voice that he heard. He turned his attention to that. Paul went, in fact, if you read there, Paul went from questioning who are you to responding with who he was. In other words, he says, who art thou, Lord, in verse 5? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for me to kick against the prick, or it's hard for you to kick against the, a, a prick or a goat with a sharp stick they would use to, to, to prod the cattle, if you will. And that's the, that's the picture that he's making there. And Paul is kicking. It hurts. And Paul was having a difficult time. But Paul, he said, Lord, what, who are you? And then he says, Lord, what would you have me to do in, in verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He turned his attention to the Lord. And I pray that you would do just that. But you would go from questioning, God, who are you and what are you doing? Or where is this coming from? To, oh, Lord, it's you. Now, what do you want me to do? Because if you look and you see in that verse there, you see that it changes his perspective. Who are you, sir? To, oh, God. Now, you can't see that necessarily in some translations, but I'm telling you in the original language, it's there that it goes from a term of respect, Lord, to Lord, Master, what would you have me to do? He responds to the Lord, and he's seeking what he desires. What do you want me to do? Not what do I want to do, not what does the president want me to do, not what does my parents want me to do, or my wife want me to do, or my neighbor want me to do, or my boss want me to do. God, what do you want me to do? I'm not the king. Not what I want to do. God, what do you want me to do? That's what Paul was saying. That's what we must say. And then once you say, listen, once he tells you, and we're going to come back to that in a minute, but then it's up to you to follow through. He told Saul to go to a place that he was going to show him. He told him to go into Damascus. But Saul still had to follow through with it. Now Saul acted as if he was. Lord, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. But how many times does sometimes we say, oh, I'm going to do something. Oh, yes, Lord, I'm going to do that. And then something comes up and the fear goes away or something else interferes or something else gets our attention and we forget about what we told the Lord. Oh, that that would not happen this time. We'd follow through and, oh, God, what do you want me to do? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to help me to learn? Maybe it's an increase in our faith. Maybe it's to do something for him. Whatever it is, not just this coronavirus, anything in life where God tries to get your attention is seeking what he desires and then following through. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy to follow through. Your, your old flesh is going to battle you. There's going to be somebody that says, hey, you're crazy. Don't be a Jesus nut. Hey, don't follow through on that. You should rethink that if you would. But when God has told you something, there's nothing to think about. Once you know it's him, Saul knew it was him, there's nothing to think about. But we've got to follow through. And God will give us the strength to do that very thing. But as Saul went into Damascus, it was not easy for Saul. He was blind. He had to humble himself and be led in. If you read the rest of that passage, which we won't take to do right now, you'll see that he was led in to that city. And he was blind. And he was needy. That's not easy to do to our pride. To say, hey, I need help. Maybe you say, Lord, help me. The Lord, send me help. Whatever it might be. And then also the fact that we look and we see the first Simon that was there. We didn't read about that, but there's another believer there, or a believer, and he's scared of Saul. He's heard about Saul. Tells the Lord, I'm scared to help him. But God says, I want you to help him. It's not going to be easy to obey the Lord. It's not. There are many, you say, well, sometimes it is easy. Sometimes it might be, but not to follow through completely, obediently, sacrificially, all the way. It, it, there's, the devil's not going to let it be easy for you, and we've got to trust the Lord. Listen, if you're not saved, you've got to get saved. It, that's the first step, but we'll come back to that in a minute. I want you to understand that it requires faith to follow through on that. It requires faith in him. Saul had to have faith in what God was telling him. Simon had to have faith that Saul wasn't going to have him arrested or killed. It requires faith. But I want you to see that when you have that faith and when you respond to him and when he's got your attention and you're doing what he wants you to do, what will he have you to do? Well, I think it's 
part is personal. Personal. First of all, when you're doing what God wants you to do, don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Don't worry about what God's told them to do. Don't worry about if they're telling if they're doing what God's telling them to do. Now, I know sometimes we have responsibilities, parents or as pastors or as friends or as brothers, whatever it might be, to encourage somebody. That's not what I mean. Don't get caught up in what their task is. Don't even get caught up in first and foremost with are they doing their task. You work on your task. You work on you work on you. You're responsible for you. That's what I tell my children. That's what I tell my church. That's what God tells me. You are responsible for you. Back in the book of John, if you want to turn there, you can. John chapter 21, in verse 21, Jesus had, had risen, and now he had met the disciples again. They were on the lake, and, and, and he reestablishes Peter, if you remember. Peter had failed him and betrayed him. But something happens where God is calling Peter to follow him and to obey all the way to the end. And Peter, in verse 21, says to Jesus, Lord, what would you have this man to do? He's looking at John. And Jesus says to him in verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. In other words, you follow me. Don't worry about what else happens to anybody else as far as you obey. You obey. And you worry about what I told you to do. Oh, that it be personal to us, that we personally would obey, that we personally would follow. Not just in a group, not just as a church, but personally, individually, that we would follow. I also want you to understand that it's not just personal, but progressive. God doesn't give you everything right away up front. He told, Pete, he told Paul what to do was to go into Damascus and to find Simon that was going to help him. To go to Damascus and to wait. That's what he told him to do. He didn't tell him the rest. He didn't tell Paul about how he was going to make him to be the greatest missionary in the New Testament age. The greatest uh, test, uh, missionary that perhaps the world has ever seen. He didn't tell him that. He didn't tell Paul or Saul that he was going to change his name to Paul. He didn't tell Saul that he was later going to be stoned and that he later was going to be beheaded and imprisoned and shipwrecked. He didn't tell him he was going to go to death and, and get his life for him. He didn't tell him all that up front. Now, we need to understand that's a possibility. But my point is this. God doesn't give you every step along, every step all up front. He gives them to you progressively along the way. Go here, and I'll tell you what to do next. God's under no obligation, as I've said many times, to my church. And for those of you that are part of my church, you remember me saying this. God's under no obligation to tell you step two until you've done step one. And oh, how I pray that you understand it's a progression but also that when you obey God, it's powerful. When God gives you something to do, it's mighty. It's big. Don't ever get the idea that, oh, this is just some menial little task. Everything that God would have you to do is a big deal or God wouldn't have you to do it. Sometimes people say, well, I want to do a big thing or I want to do a great thing. I don't want to do this little thing like sweep the church or clean or the carpet or, or clean the toilets or do maintenance or mow grass or teach a Sunday school class or whatever you think is small and below you. Listen, God said the least come first. God says that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And what I'm telling you is, no matter what God tells you to do, it is a big deal. And God will give you the strength and help you to do it. His plans are mighty. His plans are right. And oh my, how he will be with you. He will go with you. He will strengthen you for what he has called you to do. His plans are now, let me wrap up this way, and I'm going to be done. I want to give you some very practical things that in these days, in every day, really, but especially with this coronavirus in mind, what are some things that we can do? Because we struggle with what can I do? I'm secluded in my home, or I'm out of work, or we can't go to church, or whatever it might be. And I know there's some churches that are meeting, and praise God for that. Again, we here right now are doing just the online, but my point is this. In the things that we do, there's some very practical things that we can do in these days. Number one, number one, if you are not saved and you're hearing my voice right now, oh, that you would call on him. That is number one. The number one thing is for you to turn to him in repentance, realizing that you can't get to heaven any other way than through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God, in love, made a way for you. 
Adam and Eve sinned. If you don't know the whole story, I'm not going to tell it now. But sin came upon this world and death because of sin. And God made a plan knowing that death was going to come and sin was going to come. And separation from God was going to come. And he sent his son, God himself, on this earth as a man who lived and he died and he paid your price. We can't do anything to earn salvation. Can't do anything to earn God's favor. But Jesus Christ did it all. And he lovingly made a way for you to spend an eternity in a real place in heaven and not go to a real place, a terrible place, forever, called hell. Be saved today. I know this is Wednesday night prayer study. And I know that most of you may be the ones that come on Wednesday night. And, and so I'm saved I'm just saying, if there's anybody, we don't, I don't know, and you don't know me, as far as my eternal destiny. Only God knows that, and only I know that, and only you know that for you. But I'm saying this, is be saved. Number two, don't be afraid. We talk about fear the last two Sundays, and one was that we're not to fear. Meaning, listen, it's one thing to be startled, it's one thing to be alarmed, it's one thing to be concerned. That's not what we're talking about, but don't be consumed. Don't be paralyzed by your fear. Continue in obedience, in faith, trusting God. But then the second Sunday, this past Sunday, I said there is a reason for fear, and that's that Christ is coming soon. But my point is all this. We don't have to be afraid because if we know Christ and we're ready to meet him and we're telling others about him, we don't have to live in fear, not a paralyzing fear. A motivating, healthy, respectful fear, yes, motivating our lives, not a paralyzing, engulfing fear. Don't be afraid. Number three, tell others the good news. Give them hope. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Point them to the scriptures. Point them to the Savior. Point them to the cross. Those are some practical things that we can do in general. And very quickly, let me give you some specific things specific to this coronavirus. Number one, encourage others. Oh my, how we need hope. Oh my, how there are people that are mired right now in depression and discouragement because of all that is going on. Because of the confusion, because of the frustration, that's the devil that wants to cause that. But we can stand in the solid rock of Jesus Christ, of God's word, of his promises, that he's not going to leave us, and he won't allow our foot to slip, and we can trust in him. But people need to be encouraged, spiritually, but also physically, mentally, psychologically. Listen, call on others and give them an encouraging word. Let them know you love them. Let them know you care. Communication. There's people that are isolated by themselves. I know there's jokes about how we're not supposed to gather in three. That means i got to get rid of some of my kids or get somebody else out of the house. I understand that some of us have big families there. But there are countless others that are by themselves or have nobody to turn to. Turn to somebody. The elderly in particular, those that aren't able to get out right now because this may impact them more than it impacts somebody that's younger. That's just a, a, a statistic and a reality of this coronavirus that's going on right now. And certainly I know that there are some in this church, their families have said, don't you get out. Don't you, do you stay at home? They need to be checked on. They need to be called and communicated with and, and conversed with. Find somebody that you can communicate with. The elderly, it doesn't matter what age they are, but I think particularly of them. Listen, we've got technology like this. You can, so we, we can't go to our house. You can Facebook message them. You can text them. You can call them. We can go on Facebook and in just a few minutes' time, we can write a message of love and compassion and friendship and encouraging words to somebody on Facebook. And I want to encourage you to do that with you know, five, ten people a day. Just send a message to somebody different. Make a list and check it off. We've got friends on Facebook or Instagram or, or wherever where we can just send them a message to, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. And then do it. Don't be insincere, but do it. But listen, use the technology at our disposal. You pick up the telephone and call somebody to say, hey, 10 seconds, I just want to let you know, I'm thinking of you. I love you. I'm here for you. Are you okay? Do you need to talk? Can we talk? Listen, mail something. The, the post office is still running. The mailmen are still working. Pray for them too. But mail something to somebody. Mail a letter. Sometimes it is as impersonal as social media can be. For some, they want that physical letter, a postcard, a card, a letter, a note, something, anything. It doesn't take much. It take a few minutes. You have no idea how much a few minutes will help encourage and lift somebody's spirits 
if we would just take the time to do it. You know, a card. Maybe, maybe it's a package. Maybe you send, again, I, I'm not saying that you send this to a stranger, but maybe some in your family. You send something, uh, 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 some cookies or some baked goods or, uh, listen, any number of things. We can do that without spreading the virus, can't we? Wash your hands. Be clean about it. I understand the concerns, but send a little care package. A, again, a gift of some kind. We're still getting up to the stores for the most part, but maybe you can call somebody and say, hey, can I go to the store for you? I'll leave it on your porch, or I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stick it somewhere where you can get it without us having to be within a certain distance of each other. A neighbor, a co-worker, somebody. Oh, somebody. Help somebody. Reach out and touch somebody. Send them something. A letter thanking them uh, just for being your friend. Listen, there's all kinds of things that we can do. The third thing is this. Make the most of the time that you have. We have more downtime now than we've had before. At least I do. I'm sure maybe you do. I know they're busy with teaching you know, our, our kids, perhaps, and, and helping them with their learning. Uh, maybe you know, the younger people are busy doing those kind of things. But we do have more time. Some of us are out of work. Some of us uh, are unable to go to work, whatever the case may be. Uh, work is shut down. Father, I pray, and, and I, again, I pray for those businesses. I pray for those workers and for you in situations like that. But take the time with the family that you have. The older I get, the more I realize I want time with those loved ones, my kids. Time is running out. Our time in this world is running out. Our time to spend time together is running out. We don't know that we have another day. We don't know they have another day. Oh, that we would spend time together. We take advantage and not neglect our family. Make it fun. Play a game. Read your Bible. Pray. Make the most of the silver lining that we have in this gray, dreary days. Oh, my friends, I pray that you would find something, some way to reach out, some way to help somebody, some way to communicate to your family love and hope that God can put in your heart. Thank you, oh God, for doing that for me. Thank you for helping me. Father, help me to find new ways, I pray. God, I pray that you would help us to do that today. Be with those in need. Be with those that are hurting. Touch them as only you can, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with me this hour. Thank you for taking the time to log on. And if you're not live and you watch later, again, you can go to PleasantHillSBC.com and you can click on the YouTube link. It'll be there shortly. Also, you can go to the uh, you can go to the, the sermons, and it's going to be there in the podcasts, and you can listen to it again. You can also go to those other social media uh, or those those other podcasting platforms and check those things out. If I can ever be a help to you, please don't hesitate to contact me through the website. And if you have my phone number, that you can message me on Facebook, on Instagram. Please, I want to help if I can. I want to be able to. Be a help, be an encouragement, be a friend to you. Thank you. Look to Jesus, trust him, he will see us through. Until next time, thank you.